It's my joy and honor and privilege to introduce our speaker uh, for today, uh, Dr. Antoinette uh, Ines, I got it right? Actually, Ines Rivera is Dean of Alliance Graduate School of Counseling Program, um, and she's the master uh, Program Director for the Masters in Mental Health Counseling here uh, at uh, Nyack College. And uh, Dr. Tony, as she's preferred, she prefers to go by, is a graduate of Regent University, where she uh, obtained her PhD in psychology and counseling with a specialization in counselor education and supervision. Dr. Tony's bilingual abilities uh, afforded her the opportunity to conduct an international research study where she investigated the counseling needs of the Honduran population in country. Her study has been published in the American Counseling Association publication in 2013, and the title of it, Counseling Around the World, an International Handbook. Uh, when she is not teaching and running AGSC, she speaks and teaches abroad, serving the native uh, heart, uh, Honduran in, um, in Honduras and Latino families in the U.S. Uh, through their hardships and their sufferings. Dr. Tony's motivation behind integrating her story with her work and ministry is hinged on her personal discovery of what, in, what true inner healing actually looks like. And throughout her life, she has learned to exercise many strategies toward developing a healthy and healed mind and spirit. The reward she benefits, benefited from uh, this difficult work culminated in the revelation that she was born with a specific God-given purpose and plan to fulfill in this world. Dr. Tony has discovered that this gift is offered to all by our Heavenly Father, believing that we just have to be willing to do the difficult internal work by following the Holy Spirit's leading. And I read that because it's important for us to understand the caliber of people who lead our departments and our programs here at uh, Nyack College and Alliance Theological Seminary, Alliance Graduate School of Counsel, Counseling. But I also want to make it very clear, and one of the things that I've gotten to, I've only gotten to know Dr. Tony just recently, but one of the things that I have seen in her is a heart for the Lord, a heart for his people, and a heart to see people healed and set free. And so would you join me in welcoming Dr. Tony as she comes to the minister for Let me get my 20 minutes going. <laughs> Don't want to mess with that. God bless you. Wow. You know, as we were sitting here, I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, you know, such a privilege. And, you know, we always kind of say the same thing, the same, you know, privilege, pleasure to be here. But honestly speaking, the pleasure and the privilege comes for me from the fact that I am busy, busy, busy at my work here, and then the Lord just sequesters me and stops me and says, uh, you are needed mm. elsewhere. Amen. And so um, that's why this is such a privilege for me, because God would, I feel as though God ha would trust me to give you a few minutes of something, whatever he would put in my heart. So. I want to give you, um, well, first I wanted to, uh, I want to give away three books. How's that? So I have a question. The question is, what is your purpose here at Nyack College? Who would dare, st stand up. Come on. What, a quick answer. What is your purpose here? Amen. You get a book. <laughs> Who else? Who else wants to go? What is your purpose? Yes, go ahead. Come. What do you think your purpose here is? Uh, to learn to love the unlovable. Amen. Beautiful. Beautiful. Anybody else? One more. It could be some of my peeps if you want. <laughs> Gina? Come on. Anybody? And then I'll tell you, yes, tell me, well, I was, tell us. Tell us. I, was, I was called to be pastor and to serve God. Any way he wants me to go, I'm going. Amen. And that's why you're here. Bless the Lord and bless you. So the new book that I just gave away is uh, not my book, but I am in it. My story is in that book. I'm actually story number seven. And when I first got the book, I said, 
seven, I'm the last one? And of course the Holy Spirit said, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. So I was happy. And the Lord showed me, your story is the one people are going to remember. But anyway, that's, um, that's why I'm, I'm here today. I, you know, I'm a storyteller. I remember years ago in the 90s in my church, we were doing rap in the street. And I was a storyteller. And I was rapping it. I don't even know what got into me. My kids looked at me like, really, Mom? Really? No, I did background vocals. But um, I love story. I love to tell stories. Right now, I have a three and a half uh, year old grandson that when he visits, it's all about reading and telling him stories. And I love telling him stories about Jesus. He's just learning about that now. And so with that, I definitely want to tell you my story. And I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about here. I left for home yesterday so exhausted. I got home with a plan. Okay, I'm going to pray. I'm going to read. I'm going to write. I'm going to... And as soon as I ate something, I said, Lord, I'm tired. Good night. <laughs> and at uh, 9.30, I was in bed and then tossing and turning. But I knew that God would show up. It's not about me showing up, right? It's about him. And what does he want to... What does he want to disseminate here tonight? What does, you know, the big pie, we've all heard that kind, that language, you know, it's a big pie and then he cuts it up and gives you the slices and what would he give you tonight? And that's my objective here. And so, you know, I have to warn you that, uh, you know, the story's not a pretty one, um, but I love it. I love my story. And I read somewhere once, actually it's a book um, called Untold, uh, The Untold Story. And uh, the author is a Christian psychologist. And he says, um, when you don't like your story, right? When you don't like your story, then you must not like the author of your story. If you love the author, then you must love the story that the author has already written about you. And the beautiful part of this is he didn't just start writing the story about you. This story was written, your story was written way before you were even thought of. He already had it down. He already knew what was coming. And so... I love that because Psalms 139 tells us that he saw our unformed body, right, in our mother's womb, and all the days ordained for me were already written in his book mm -hmm. before one day came to be. Doesn't that prove that he's been on us for a long time? And the thing is, you are born, you're born with your story, already in place for you. Stories can be horrific. Stories can be sad. Stories can be traumatic. Stories can be tragic. I always tell my students, just because you think you grew up in, in a Leave it to Beaver family or, you know, the Brady Bunch don't mean you're all that. Because usually those families are perfectionists. Think about it. So then you grow up with this need to be perfect. And what a burden that could be, right? So whether you grow up in tragedy or you grow up seemingly like you know your family was just the perfect situation, uh, there is always something that we will have to wrestle with. And so I'm, I'm gonna show you a quick little picture. I'm a visual person. I love photos, they say, you know, a thousand words in a photo. I probably didn't get that quote right, but. So when you look at this little girl, which I'm sure most of you have already guessed, it's me. I'm five years old. I mean, do I even, really, honestly, do I look like I was born with a purpose here? I mean, I look so lost and I look, I'm like staring in, the, in space like a deer in headlights. 
when I first saw this picture, I said, goodness, they didn't even cut my bang straight. <laughs> I look like a hot mess. Well, to be honest with you, that's because I was born into a very tragic, uh, traumatic life. I mean, my mom had me at 17. Uh, I was first born, and then one right after the other came four more kids. And so I literally took on the persona of mother, caretaker. So I am very, very nurturing. Ask my faculty and staff. They will prove it to you. <laughs> I'm very nurturing. And so, you know, I grew up in this environment of chaos and, you know, filth and just a mess. It was just a mess. And so I was about five there, but around 10 years old, I was, um, I, I was uh, being molested by an uncle. And so I need to drink water. My throat is ready to crack. And so I was only 10 years old, and that started to happen. And um, yeah, it just got worse and worse and worse. So at 14 years old, I became impregnated by this half uncle. Doesn't matter, it's my uncle. Um, who literally posed as our father, me and my four siblings. And, uh, and once he figured that out, uh, then he was on a mission to kill this uh, fetus, make sure that he got rid of the evidence. This was back in the 70s. And um, God, notice the smile. I mean, God, who else? But I'm telling you, I shouldn't be sane. I should have been a drug addict, a prostitute. I should have been a woman with multiple personality issues and disorders and diagnoses. But I love to say it over and over again. But God. Amen. Would you believe that it was God's will to allow me to have that baby at 15 years old? Could you, could you wrap your head around that? Can you like say, really God, you would do that? Well, let me tell you, that baby saved my life. That baby taught me how to love. I, ha I had to make a choice early on in my life, am I going to love this little thing or am I going to despise this little thing? And maybe because I have such a nurturing soul, and I really do, I can mother you to death. <laughs> well, not to death, but I could mother you. Um, I love being, that's my favorite thing, I love being a mother. And now a grandmother, forget it, even better. But this child taught me how to love. This child, who I have to say, I mean, is he not my twin? I mean, Dr. Orozco, did I not tell you? I mean, he's my twin. Even that was a blessing from God. That God would create him to look exactly like his mom. That's amazing to me. We go places and people are like, that's your little brother? No, that's my big son. Because he's like 6'3". And this is the boy that taught me how to live, how to breathe, how to, how to desire to, to do better as opposed to running away. So I had to be grateful. And by the way, I didn't even know who God was in those days. And then here comes my husband, Benjamin Rivera. Oh my God, another big change in my life. We married, I was just a 20 year old young lady and we married and had two more children. And you know, during those times, um, I went through so much development psychologically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, 
There was so much growth to do. And can I tell you, it is the hardest thing to surrender yourself to that level of growth, right? In the midst of your troubles, in the midst of shame. I lived with so much shame for so many years, even after I came to Christ. The church really didn't teach me how not to live with shame. They didn't teach me what to do with shame. I was a teenage mother. And I mean, of course I can excuse and say not of my volition, not of my choice, but so what? It doesn't matter. It was my choice to choose to love this child. And that I did. In the name of Jesus, through the power of Jesus, through him being my teacher. He was my teacher. And I only wanted to surrender to him over and over and over again. So, you know, during this time, I talked, I, I titled this talk, you know, Lost with a Purpose. You know, I lost my innocence as a little girl. Then, after I got a little older, then I lost myself. Once that abuse surfaced, I was a goner. It was a miracle. A miracle of God that he wooed me back in. Mm. He did it. It was all him. And then if all of that wasn't bad enough, then my life started to kind of stabilize and get better. And, you know, my marriage good. And I had my daughter, Ruben's growing now. And we're good, you know, we're doing good. And all of a sudden the past and the abuse starts to surface and now I'm not doing good. Now I'm depressed, suicidal, the whole nine, because that's what that kind of stuff does to you. Um, but then I got through that. Let me get to that point. I got, me and my husband, we got through it and we grew through it. And in the midst of all of that, we had our last baby, Benjamin Jacob and then all of a sudden, he was a little older, then I started going to school, and God just, you know, his purpose, his plan. He's got a purpose and he's got a plan, right? Since the beginning, since before I was born, he had already written all this down for me. So I'm just going, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm moving. I'm moving, I'm, I, I'm on a journey. I know where I'm going, I'm on a journey. Go to school, get a doctorate, blah, 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 blah all that stuff, and, um, not to minimize what God has done. Because I know, I'm the only one that knows that this was not the plan of the enemy for me. He had a plan for me, but God's plan prevailed. He was, his plan trumped Satan's plan. Bottom line. And God was like, this is mine. This, this one here is mine. You can't have her. And that's how he feels about each and every one of you. And just when I thought things were going beautifully, I'm whole, I'm sane, inner healing. You know, I did, I did 30 years of work, guys. It's a long time to do reading and research and writing and all of that. And then we have our last tragedy, which was... Uh, for God to choose to take our boy home. At 27 years old, Benjamin Jacob was taken home by like a rare virus, airborne thing that lasted 28 days and he was gone. And there again, my soul was tested. There again, my faith in God was tested. I almost, I gotta admit, I almost failed this one. I almost failed it. I kind of forgot everything he had done way back in the day for me. And this was such a blow that I almost, I, I almost got a zero on that exam. But once again, the Lord has a plan. The Lord has a purpose. I love what it says in Ephesians 2, and Dr. Scales read it to us this morning. It says, for we are God's workmanship, created 
in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Are you willing to do the work that God has already set in place for you? Are you willing to set aside all of your trials and tribulations, all of your hurts and habits, all of your disappointments, and say, God, I get it. This is part of living, but you are my life. You are the air that I breathe. You are the reason I live. So as long as you keep it coming, I'm going to keep breathing. I, I, saw, I, I hear an Andre Crouch song coming. Yes. It's like just it starts coming in my spirit. I'm going to keep on singing. I'm going to keep on shouting. I wish I remember the rest of the lyrics. Meanwhile, he's my favorite. Because Jesus Christ is coming. And he's coming for a beautiful church. He's coming for a church that is waiting for him. Let me tell you what the death of my son did for me. It opened my soul. It opened my spiritual eyes to eternity. Mm -hmm. I was a Christian for 40 years. I never even used to think about heaven. I'm too busy down here. Who got time for that? <laughs> I'm like, mm, okay, I got, why I, I got, so I had a PhD to do it. But what? The hope of glory, knowing that I will be called there one day and I get to see my boy again. And by the way, that uncle, let me just take you there, that uncle on his deathbed accepted Jesus Christ into his heart and he repented of his sin. Don't know how, don't, I got the report, that's all I know. And so guess what? When I go to heaven, he very well may be one of the ones in the crowd waiting for me. But the beautiful thing is heaven is not here. It's going to be so different. I'm already anticipating that. And I know that God will do it. So I'm so happy that while I'm here, I got all this stuff straightened out. That's what's important to me. Because when I get there, I want to hear. What do you want to hear when you get there? Well done, my good and faithful servant. I allowed this in your life. I allowed that in your life. And you still stood your ground with me. And God will honor you. God will bless you. I can tell you that I live with a joy that is indescribable. Ask my people on the 20th floor. All of them. Ask them. Come on. Is Dr. Tony really like that? Yes, I am. Yeah, do I have... Bad days, do I have days that, you know, but I come in and I tell them, listen, I cried all the way to work, an hour and a half. Let me chill for a little while. I'll be with you in a little bit. I tell them, I admit it to them. And they pray for me. But overall, it's about joy. It's about dancing and, and joy cometh in the morning. I refuse to live in depression and, and mourning cloths. Because my God reigns. And he already knew I was going to endure every single thing that I have endured in life. And all I want to do is glorify him Amen. through it all. Amen. Amen. Amen? God bless you. I am done. Dr. Tony. Thank you, thank you. As she was uh, sharing her story and uh, encouraging us even as she was walking us through the pain that she's gone through and testifying of God's faithfulness in her life. This is what, uh, this is what came to mind and this is, uh, this is what I would like to leave you with. Even in the midst of your pain, God is still writing a story in your life. You are his poema, his poem. Your past does not determine your purpose. Your problems are not devoid of God's presence. And what the enemy means for evil, 
God is working it out for your good. Hallelujah. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And regardless what others might say, God is the author of your story. He has the final word. And his pen is still writing. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 God bless you.